<laughs> Look, I'm Michael Spence. I'm President and Provost um, here at UCL, and thank you so much for joining us for this lecture. You know, questions of identity, and in particular of national identity, are obviously incredibly complex. So um, I have eight children, and we are a 23 passport family. So it's a <laughs> constant conversation topic of conversation. I remember. Um, once one of my children when they were seven crying and saying I just wish we lived in a normal family and I said what's a normal family and he said one where you have at least one set of grandparents on the same continent or um, the conversation that I had um, this morning with my now um, six-year-old who said um, I'm uh, I'm the product of three continents whereas my half-sister is only the product of two continents <laughs> these issues are personal and deep and profound and therefore I just cannot imagine the horror of having a government say you don't belong this isn't your home it's been your home for decades but you don't and we know that in all sorts of ways the Windrush scandal is something that will leave very long-lasting effects not just on the individuals involved but also on the fabric of our society much more broadly and so it is a tremendous privilege to be able to introduce Dr. Rochelle Burgess, the principal investigator for the project Ties That Bind, which is the first study to map the mental health impacts of the, the Windrush scandal. And Dr. Burgess is leading the project to shine a spotlight on what the victims and their families, but also importantly, their communities have been through and what the ongoing effects might be, collecting a range of evidence to raise awareness but also hopefully to empower those communities as they deal with the issue and as then um, the, the government and, and society more general, generally deals with this great blot on um, the history, the recent history of Britain. So um, Dr. Burgess, it's a tremendous privilege to introduce you. Thank you so much, Provost, and thanks again for the opportunity to, to share uh, some of my work and to share things that are uh, I'm deeply passionate about with the UCL community and uh, the wider community, the world. Um, so I have had the privilege of working in mental health spaces for many, many years, uh, not as a clinician, but as a scholar activist. Um, and one of the main things that I um, see my role as a, as a scholar and an activist linked to is trying to make very clear the connections between the world that we live in and how they make mental health possible or impossible. And in the many years that I've been doing this work in different parts of the world, I've uh, never felt more deeply about the need to have conversations about mental health and mental health enabling environments um, than when I first encountered um, the Windrush scandal. I also uh, interpret this as uh, a woman of Jamaican descent with family members who at various points in their life uh, spent time in the UK as members of the Windrush generation, some who remained and some who left the UK and went to Canada, which is um, where my passport is from still at the moment. Um, so I very much recognize Provost, the discussions about multiple passports in a household. My, my four-year-old has two. Um, but I think in our time together today, I, I really want to talk about, you know, the consequences of that impossible and painful reality of being told that where you imagine home to be is not your home. Um, and I want to talk a bit about how in a collaborative piece of work alongside other activists, psychologists and survivors of the scandal that we're trying to really show um, the realities of what this has done to the fabric of communities and families. So I'm here with you today as part of UCL's Black History Month celebrations and, and ultimately uh, you cannot talk about Black British history without talking about Windrush. And it's very much a case now of two stories. Once a metaphor for the generation of people who answered a call to help rebuild this country after World War II, it is now uh, synonymous with globally recognized episodes of state violence uh, that have been 
labeled by many as cruel. Uh, and the scandal and subsequent management and often mismanagement of the um, events and the compensation scheme is also recognized globally. And while there have been a series of uh, apologies about the events that have transpired, many feel that these apologies have not translated into meaningful action for survivors of the scandal. Um, so many people might know this, but for those who don't, um, as part of national efforts to rebuild the country after the Second World War, the United Kingdom passed the 1948 British Nationality Act, which was designed to inspire members of the British Commonwealth countries to migrate to England. And in 1948, uh, 492 people from the Caribbean, many of them returning servicemen from World War II, arrived on the SS Empire Windrush, which docked in Essex, not too far where I'm speaking to you from today. Um, and it was the, the catalyst of a much wider and longer migration of Caribbean people to the UK, which established a generation of Afro-Caribbean people moving to the UK between 1948 um, and the um, about the late 60s, known as the uh, Windrush generation. And the image on the left of this slide is actually um, a telegram from the National Archives, which details um, some of the invitation to specifically Jamaican citizens outlining interest in invitations for skilled workers of various forms to come and, and help the country. Um, and in that time, over and nearly half a million non-white citizens of the Commonwealth migrated to the UK. And if we flash forward another 60 years, um, prior to the Windrush scandal, there were a series of um, policy documents and, um, and legislation, immigration legislation changes that slowly transferred the status of the Windrush community and their children towards categories of, of illegal immigrants, erroneously. Um, and in 2014, against the backdrop of strict quotas and targets for the removal of immigrants more broadly within the Home Office, many members of the Windrush generation were stripped of their access to health care, pensions and their rights as citizens, which they had lived with and, and enjoyed in this country for decades. Um, and this meant by 2018, it was estimated um, at that time that approximately 30,000 members of the Windrush generation were affected by policy errors and the hostile environment more widely. And looking at this uh, image on the uh, right of this slide, which is of a Windrush campaigner um, uh, who has been still struggling to access justice um, despite all of the efforts that have happened in, in recent years, um, we see that um, there is still much to be done. And I, I really speak to you today um, from the point of a scholar who inspires me greatly, um, Audre Lorde, who has been quoted as saying that there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. And this is something that has been manifest in all of the work that I do. And it is very much a part of the framing that I do today because not only is it um, Black History Month, but next week is World Mental Health Day. And I strongly feel that there is an intersection to be considered between the two themes um, of these, these moments. For World Mental Health Day, there is a call to make mental health and well-being for all a global priority. And the Black History Month theme for this year is time for change, action, not words. Um, and I strongly feel that part of making health, mental health and well-being uh, a global priority and a local priority um, in the UK requires a response to the mental health needs of Black communities, particularly those who have been affected by the Windrush scandal. And so for the rest of my talk and our time together today, I want to explore three things. First is the importance of uh, thinking through the specific pathways through which the mental health consequences of the Windrush scandal emerge. Um, as mentioned by um, the provost, there are very few studies, potentially no other studies that really look specifically at mental health and the mental health consequences, despite the fact that this is obviously a very traumatic ordeal for many individuals and their families. I'd then like to talk a little bit about justice, um, 
a big part of the response to the, the scandal has been movements for justice for these communities. And I want to put our arguments about mental health within the lens of these efforts for justice and sort of how we can think about moving forward. And then finally, I'll talk a bit about uh, the project um, that we are working on to try and create a space to think through these processes and the importance of um, the inclusion of survivors in this, in this space. Um, we started the project earlier this year and have been taking our time to engage in dialogue with communities about the ways, best ways to take the, um, the project forward and how they would like to be involved and engaged in, in this space. So I'll talk a bit about that to wrap us up. So as mentioned, I've been working in mental health for some time now, and, and what I'm really interested in, in this is the notion of creating mental health enabling societies. Um, in this particular framework, what we're really interested in is thinking not specifically about, not only specifically about services and what services look like, but the fact that the capability for people to be mentally healthy, healthy is deeply embedded to the environments that they live in, their societies, their access to various resources. And for World Mental Health Day last year, colleagues and I wrote about what that might mean um, in, in a commentary for The Lancet. And we argued that good mental health was about much more than the presence or absence of, of services or the presence or absence of a mental health condition in and of itself. But what we needed to really think of as seeing mental health more clearly determined by the capacity of people to live good lives, to have um, a strong sense of self, um, personhood anchored their ability to contribute to and improve society, um, their families, their relationships. And of, a lot of that is very much um, linked to this notion of flourishing, which has been talked about in mental health in, in various ways as something that's related to not just people's ability to, to um, sort of have good mental health, but also to manage episodes of mental ill health, which can still, um, people who have mental health conditions still have the ability to flourish. And so um, ultimately we talk a lot about the need to move our reflections to societies um, and really talk about how um, enabling good mental health sometimes means changing people's lived realities um, and thinking a bit more about systemic interventions to the body politic. Um, and so when we try to think about the, the possibility of mental health or what a mental health enabling environment might look like in the context of and the wake of the Windrush scandal, um, what I have found helpful um, is uh, a framework by Wallace and scholars. Um, they're uh, based in the United States. And in their work, they try to map how social determinants are used to can be used to sort of identify the impact of state level immigrant policies on health and it provides sort of a multi-dimensional framework for us to look at how these political and policy environments have downward consequences for people's um, specific health outcomes um, so in terms of state policy domains, this refers to the legal foundations of public policy, the political environment that it creates for migrants and immigrants, and particularly those who might have undocumented status or um, status that is sort of in flux. And for many Windrush uh, scandal survivors, they experienced those tensions of living um, in states where their um, status was undetermined and unclear. Um, and there were various policies that created an environment where that was allowed to happen. So specifically the Immigration Acts of 2014 and 2016 existed as legal mechanisms through which survivors were ultimately denied um, access to rights to live and work in the UK, to claim benefits, to um, have access to their pensions, to receive and use health care, ultimately wrongfully excluding many of them from their right um, to su receive support from the British state. 
Um, in terms of institutions and systems, these are identified as economic or social structures that create environments to support or harm the health of people. So these are include health, education, welfare, and criminal justice systems that can contribute to the creation of environments that are ultimately detrimental to the health of, of um, migrants and, and immigrants, and in our case, the Windrush community. And one particular system that comes to mind has received a lot of attention was um, sort of the NHS and sort of reporting duties that faced many NHS staff to verify the immigration status of various patients before treatment, which is something that led to the denial of crit very critical sort of life-saving health services for many Windrush survivors, forcing many to either pay out of pocket for treatment or suffer very prolonged and more complex illness um, pathways as a result. If we look at individual needs and outcomes, this relates to identifying the differential experiences that immigrants might be granted due to their positions within society, and then how that position in society differentially impacts them. So their experiences of social structures also um, have then psychological, psychological impacts on individuals as they then try to navigate um, society. Um, here we're thinking about stress and anxiety and how this can sometimes then play into decisions that people make about um, health behaviors and service use. So really not wanting to potentially engage in public services because of the ways in which they have been treated by them. And also how the potential loss of personhood has real damaging impacts on people's well-being. And finally, this leads to specific health consequences and, and the model draws our attention to three broad indicators. Um, the outcome of reduced access to health services overall, which leads to reduced quality of life and lower health status. Um, but I think that it is um, important to note here that we're very well aware of the consequences that uh, faced Windrush survivors as a result of this particular types of pathways. Um, to, in 2021, reports stated that there were at least 23 um, survivors who died before re receiving any compensation. And I think it's also important to, to hold the truth that um, this scandal came into a world that was already unequal um, in various ways. Um, and members of the Windrush community were already in high risk groups in many cases where they already experienced various health inequalities. Um, for example, the NHS uh, Race and Health Observatory put out um, a report recently that highlighted that racialized health inequalities around maternal deaths, severe mental illness, and cardiovascular diseases existed among their priority areas of concern to address for Black and other minority ethnic communities. And I think that one thing, this model tells us a lot of really important things about the ways in which um, sort of wider policy environments and, and uh, can start to chip away at people's health. Um, but one of the things that I try to move beyond in my own work is not thinking of these sorts of pathways as linear, but actually pathways that intersect. And in my lunch hour lecture a couple years ago, I presented an earlier version of this model where we talked about a potential socio-political economy um, in the context of mental health experiences around the world. Um, and in reality, what I have found in my work and what my colleagues that I've been working on this model with for a few years, um, we quite strongly feel um, that at the heart of many experiences of mental distress and diagnoses are the drivers, um, are many social drivers that never exist in isolation, that are constantly interacting with each other, creating multiplying effects in terms of distress, but also multiplying effects in terms of reduced access to care. And really that when we're thinking about determinants of poor mental health, we shouldn't just think about something as social or political or something that is very close to us, so proximal or very far away, and sort of a distal determinant, but that through other social processes in our lives, many of these sort of determinants become entwined and enmeshed in webs of um, in webs of factors that really um, operate in simultaneous 
in a simultaneous manner, really, for, for lack of a better word. And I think if we are wanting to think about how we deal with the mental health consequences of Windrush, we must also hold the fact that there is an intersection of the previous health inequalities that people have experienced, their previous experiences of colonialism, um, class inequalities, poor working conditions, and neighborhood dynamics that pre-exist this scandal, and the specific consequences created by this scandal and in addition to this scandal. And so we must hold these multiplicities together in order to make sense of things as we move ahead. One final bit that I would like to talk about in thinking about sort of this background to what the mental health consequences of the um, scandal are um, is to hold true that um, a crisis or a scandal doesn't ever happen to one person particularly for people who live within strong kin and collective networks and cultures. And, and, and I think very much um, the Windrush scandal has happened to constellations of people and constellations of households. For every survivor, there are families and friends and community um, who have been harmed directly or indirectly by these violences. Um, and because of that, we have sort of watched um, people who we love and respect and care for be stripped of their dignity and their personhood. And this in and of itself is a vector for trauma. Now, there are many people who would argue that trauma does not automatically link to poor mental health, but it does contribute to a process which can create the development of specific mental health conditions. And so it's really important to think about consequences within and across generations. And um, uh, sort of a UK-based um, radical psychologist, um, Ghislaine Kinyuani, who is the author of a book, the book called Living While Black, uh, The Essential Guide to Overcoming Racial Trauma. She's quoted on this slide, and, and I really find that so much of her work resonates with us and the work that we're trying to do in, in acknowledging that trauma knows no boundary. And if we are to um, no boundaries in terms of time and no boundary in terms of transmission, so we ignore this to our own detriment. Um, we can also draw on frameworks from um, other scholars who have been looking at the um, sort of consequences, psychological and mental health consequences of racial injustices. Um, I'm drawn to the work of Dr. Shelley Harrell, who is an American psychologist, who has a framework to allow us to think about the different pathways through which um, many Black communities um, and marginalized communities um, are harmed by systems that are racialized and actions that are racist. And in our work, I'm really drawn to two specific pathways. Um, first is the collective experience of racism, where witnessing the racism inflicted on one's racial group carries emotional consequences. And there is evidence of this um, in many communities in um, Canada and the US, where we look at the mental health consequences um, uh, and historical trauma that affects many indigenous communities and descendants uh, across Northern the North America and the Americas more widely, and also um, in uh, Australia uh, and uh, the Pacific region, when we look at indigenous communities there. Um, this can also be linked to um, specifically um, uh, evidence that shows um, that um, witnessing the events like the death of um, George Floyd um, in 1920 had impacts on sort of wider communities who identify as Black, um, things that remind people of their own fragility. And so we really sort of see that there's these collectus and, and witnessing has emotional consequences. And then secondly, is specifically looking at transgenerational transmission, where various aspects of oppression related to historical events or contemporary events are passed on. And so uh, Ghislaine talks about this as the way that parents might teach their children to engage with others in society, um, practices that are learned uh, as survival strategies when they experience racism are then passed along and how this has an impact. But there are other pathways currently being explored in the literature, um, things along the lines of epigenetics, which I won't go into detail here. No. Sorry, I'm having trouble advancing the slide. There we go. 
But in taking I, these ideas forward, it, it, what it ultimately boils down to is that if we want to talk about um, justice for Windrush survivors and their families, we must also be talking about building environments and societies that enable their mental health. And so what might that look like in practice if we think more critically or practically about, about justice? And I'm sure that for many people joining the, the lecture today, it will not come as a surprise to you that the arc of justice is always long, but specifically for the Windrush community, this journey is just beginning and very much full of start, stops and starts and, and challenges along the way. There have been various reports over the, the past few years um, going into detail about the, the Windrush Compensation Scheme, which was launched in April 2019 as a way to sort of provide recourse to um, survivors and their families um, who were affected. Um, one such report was commissioned by the Home Office, um, and it was prepared by Wendy Williams. And this year, she um, created an update report that was released in March. And she was particularly concerned about the slow pace of the compensation program, um, noting that many survivors had very long wait times of over a year, and an overwhelming majority of those she spoke to, about 97%, really had very little trust in the systems to deliver on their promises. Um, there have been countless reports in the media, uh, Amelia Gentleman, who um, has done a lot of investigative journalism to highlight the the, the depths of difficulties that many survivors face and, and the scandal overall has written many reports um, uh, talking about um, the struggles of the compensation scheme. So for example, um, noting that fewer than 7% of applicants have received compensation. Um, a recent uh, freedom of information um, request by a labor MP earlier this year identified that for many people who appealed their decision on compensation, um, only 1% were successful in receiving payouts that were more um, commensurate to the loss that people experienced. Um, so many people sort of note that actually the burden of proof for trying to achieve any justice is then passed on to citizens and their families who have to then engage in another set of battles in order to achieve compensation and recognition for practical recognition for what has happened. And this process is something that has been identified as many survivors as re-traumatizing, additionally dehumanizing, which again has significant consequences for people's emotional well-being. Um, when you look at mental health specifically, um, my co-principal investigator um, uh, uh, has talked a lot about actually how there is very little um, acknowledgement of the specific mental health conditions or guidance for how to engage with or access care within sort of the processes and systems that have been set up for people. So there's a real underappreciation of mental health and the mental health consequences of the scandal, despite having specific mention of the word trauma. Um, and so, uh, and I think it's really important actually to remember that in addition to that, this sort of occurs in an environment there were, that there were already quite large mental health inequalities in the UK facing Black communities. Um, many studies over many years have highlighted that um, Black people are overrepresented in mental health services. So again, more data from the Race and Health Observatory noted that Black Caribbean people are eight times more likely to be subject to community treatment orders. Other reports highlight that minoritized people are 40% more likely to access mental health services to the criminal justice system rather than through care pathways. We also know that people of African and Caribbean descent are three times more likely to be diagnosed and admitted to hospital for schizophrenia than any other group. And other um, race and mental health scholars in the UK, such as Professor Simon Fernando, um, has really talked about how these sorts of inequities are very much linked to cultural competencies within the system. And so as such, we need to really think about what we're asking people to engage in when we ask them to sort of, when we 
increase their access to services. So when we think about sort of the importance of mental health, we also need to think about the reality of the landscape that we're dealing with at the moment. And so this is where our project begins. Um, I have the immense honor of working with Professor Patrick Vernon. Um, Patrick is a Black mental health activist. He's an historian, and he's a, a very active Windrush campaigner who for some time has been calling for specific attention to the mental health consequences of the scandal. Um, Patrick is my co-PI, and, and in 2019, he wrote in The Guardian about the need for a national mental health program that is focused on the post-traumatic impact of the hostile environment on the Windrush generation and their descendants. And what we're hoping to explore along with other colleagues and survivors is what that program would need to look like. And our guiding principle is that planning and development for this must come from the community. I again sort of quote Audre Lorde here in stating that sometimes that if definitions about the parameters of what is needed come from the outside, this is potentially detrimental for us. We must have a say in what is being said about us as much as possible. Um, and I think that is particularly important given the context that we are working in when so much trust has been broken. And there is very little trust in the capacity for our current systems to work in ways that will benefit and support the health and well being of the Windrush community and their descendants and wider Black communities. So I think it's really important that what is decided and what sort of arguments are developed for priorities around this national program come from the voices of the people who survive this scandal and who continue to survive various systems inequity systems of inequity at work in society. And we know from research in many other areas that when potential service users are involved in, involved in design and development, things work better, they're more efficient, and they're more widely accepted. And I think we can really learn from best practice in other areas as part of guiding us on this journey. Um, so drawing back to this idea of the full political economy of, of, of mental health or a socio-political economy of mental health, we would need much more than improved screening programs or training within home office spaces um, to have a mental health program like this be effective. There, we know that there are wider historical and structural issues at work in people's lives that will require various types of mobilization and, and, and activism in many forms um, to improve um, situations that people live in and live through. And there's a growing body of evidence from other fields, such recently um, highlighted in the climate justice field, that actually also shows the positive mental health impacts of participating in mobilization. So that when we think about sort of addressing these wider structural issues, there actually is a benefit for us emotionally, um, re relieving and removing these feelings of, of helplessness um, and loss that I think is part and parcel of experiencing these challenges. In the intermediate term, we need to think um, about local community action. And I think there is uh, a lot to be uh, said and learned from other spaces about what that community action and solidarity might look like and how interventions working at that level can make the most of sort of natural lineages that people make with each other across communities. Um, in some of his other work, Patrick has talked about models such as the emotion, emotional man, emancipation circles, which have been used in the US for dealing with community trauma, um, specifically linked to Hurricane Katrina. In some of my work in Zimbabwe, um, we have sort of highlighted intergenerational dialogue circles as, as really interesting platforms for, for dialogues to promote emotional well-being at the community level. Um, finally, when we look at the level of interventions, I think there is also much to be learned because there is existing gaps in our current packages of care um, and interventions. Um, uh, we know that certain sort of um, standard referral packages such as IAPT or online services are not always widely taken up by members of marginalized or excluded, excluded communities. Um, and given the very structural nature of many of the drivers of poor mental health that will be experienced by the Windrush community, individual interventions would really need to consider how that can be woven into practice. Um, other scholars have talked about the importance of things like compassionate therapy as a mechanism for addressing race-based trauma. Um, but I think there's a lot more to learn about 
about that before any decisions have been made. And so that is what our project is doing. We are trying to start a, a public and a policy dialogue about the mental health needs of Black communities um, across generations linked to the Windrush scandal. We want to try and develop a bit of a body of, of evidence to really illuminate what specific mental health conditions might need to be prioritized for attention by the compensation scheme, but also within the NHS. Um, and to actually give survivors and communities an opportunity to define and direct the story on, on their own terms so that services, whatever the services look like, are a very good match for what people actually say they need. So the Ties That Bind project has four broad aspects to it. Um, we have an online survey, uh, which is uh, allowing us to get an understanding um, of how the mental health what the mental health consequences of the scandal are, and this is specifically for survivors and people who identify as close families, friend and kin networks across generations. Um, people who are 16 and over are invited to participate in that. We have launch events, one in London that happened this summer and one in Wolverhampton, which is happening next week, which is where we're actually engaging in a, a bit of a dialogue about this process as a whole and what it needs to look like. Um, we are trying to engage in a process of storytelling um, using um, photo voice. Um, photo voice is a methodology that allows us to um, have direct lines of engagement and, and encounters with wider communities to raise awareness about issues and challenges, but also with a specific policy focus. So there is an interest in us developing a policy roundtable where we present main themes from the study. Um, what is wanted, why it matters, um, which will be then linked to a public exhibition of the, the photos that are taken by participants in the study. And so just another very quick summary here about why we've decided to design the study in this way. First, visual storytelling allows us to move beyond trauma. There is a lot of Windrush research that has happened in many years, not much linked to mental health specifically, but all of that research does have an effect on people. And it has an effect to emotionally sort of relive your experiences over and over again. And so for us, it's really important. Um, and this is really guided by our uh, colleague, Dawn Estefan, who is a trauma therapist who works with black, black communities um, um, across um, uh, the UK um, to really sort of ensure that we are not engaged in simply retelling stories of people's trauma, but actually creating pathways to um, vision, the, the have a vision for the future, and to recognize strengths and survival where it is present, because many people have survived and do deserve to tell their stories, those who haven't yet. Our approach also allows us to reject a potential single narrative. So if we had just done the survey, we would just have had one way of telling the story. And I think it's really important for that complexity to come through. Um, I think it's also important um, to sort of really make sure that the tools that we use to identify people's struggles make sense to them. Um, and not all tools, even if they're standardized, are appropriate to all communities. And so what this study is allowing us to do is have a chance to have conversations with people about what they think about the different methods that might be used to collect and understand their needs um, and find ones that are the most appropriate and non-traumatizing. And of course, this is an action-oriented research project, the use of photo voice, as I mentioned, which means that participants are co-researchers. And so we are hoping that survivors see themselves as that way, as co-creating the priorities and recommendations together. And so this is just a bit about the timeline of the project. Um, we started in July. The survey is available and ongoing for those who are listening and identify as this community. It is available on our project website for you to go and take a look and find out more. Um, we've got our workshop um, in Wolverhampton for our launch next week there. Um, and listed above are our partners in the project, as well as our funder, UCL Grand Challenges. In London, we are partnering with the organization Windrush Lives. And in Wolverhampton, we are partnering with the Windrush Legal Advice Clinic and the African Caribbean Community Initiative. And it is hoped that our public exhibition of photos and our policy roundtable will be held in 
um, late spring, early summer of next year. And I just want to take this moment to highlight specific the rest of our research team, um, in addition to Patrick and Dawn, Ms. Uh, Farah Shabani and Dr. Chetna Sharma. So to conclude, um, it has been my hope to really highlight that when we think about it, establishing justice for the Windrush community and their families and, and, and the wider community um, who connects with them, we need to think not just about treatment, but also the how we can work to build a mental health enabling environment. Part of that might mean the revision of the uh, Windrush um, compensation scheme, which at the moment seems to be a site of additional emotional distress and trauma for people going through that, um, but also the wider societal realities that drive for mental health more broadly. Um, and to really highlight that we are not simply here to document trauma. We want to talk about survival, engage in dialogue with various actors who have the power to drive change in meaningful ways in the lives of those who have already been disrupted. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time. And I will stop there. Look, thank you um, very much. It's um, a, a, a terrific work, and it was great to have you um, summarize it in the way that you have. Um, I'm sorry for being wrapped in a blanket. I made the foolish decision yesterday to have both my COVID booster and the flu jab on the same day, and I'm oh, sitting gosh. here shivering. <laughs> Um, I, I wonder if I could um, uh, take the chair's privilege of kicking off with a question. That is Please that do. you've rightly emphasised the importance of the agency of the community most affected. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it's clear that it has to be that community that um, sets the agenda. And yet when, in, as in this case, you, your government does something of which you are truly ashamed Mm -hmm. and so many people are, it raises questions then about what the role are of um, communities who may be othered in similar ways. So for example, mm -hmm. black people who aren't of a Caribbean of Caribbean origin or mm -hmm. um, people who, are, who identify as um, having other sorts of visible identity, but also of, um, of, of people who don't. Um, what's, what, what's the role of those broader communities in this conversation? That's a, such an important question. I'm really, really glad you asked. Um, one of the reasons that in this post, when suggesting the possible framework, that I sort of really highlight these additional levels of activism and mobilization and community solidarity is because I think that's where that lies. Um, there are conversations to be had, particularly for between othered communities where we realize that our struggles are united, I think, in the sense that we are all vulnerable. <laughs> I think when this happens to one group, it doesn't mean that everybody is protected. It means that, that we're all vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so in the ways that we can start to unpack and think about those relationships become really important. So I think there is something to be said about the necessity for that those types of wider structural realities that we need to be mobilizing and I guess resisting in a way, making clear that we see we see it and we see the problems with it. That's where that solidarity becomes really important. And I think um, that when you if you build a system even with um, with one particular community to think specifically about the windrush consequences, um, it also creates models that we can sort of look at as as I guess, packages that can be used and modified in other places. So mm. that, you know, even in sort of thinking about um, what a potential framework might look like, a lot of that work comes from different parts of the world. Again, mm. because these experiences of oppression share similar threads. And so mm. we sometimes are speaking to similar vectors uh, that, and challenges that people face, which gives us a platform to look at and explore what works and what might work um, for sort of a, for local action. So for me, I guess other communities who are othered and others who sort of feel an, a desire for solidarity um, really come in at that sort of national um, and community levels of mobilization where we're sort of doing that work of creating societies that will eventually enable people to be mental healthy, mentally healthy in the long term. 
And that is long work that can't really be done by people who are and shouldn't really be done by people who are struggling with other things. And I think that's really important to sort of think about how we sort of share share that load or share the that those different pieces of sort of a social change ecosystem. Yeah, because it's got to raise questions for um, for those people who want to stand in solidarity, doesn't it? In the sense that this was possible because of a political climate mm -hmm. and a political climate for which in one way or another, um, uh, uh, everybody and some more than others are responsible. Yeah. And, um, and, and I think the question as to what it means to take responsibility for this collectively yeah. um, is really interesting. But anyway, if in, so the, the questions are coming. If entire communities are traumatized by these kinds of events, yeah. how do we begin to help? And I suppose the question here is about the scale of the trauma and, and yeah. where do you start? Yeah. Um, it's a really it's a really difficult question. I think one of the the challenges with scale is that often when we're faced with such big numbers that you actually don't don't know how. But I think there's something quite special about um, sort of local communities. And I feel like I say this a lot because I'm a community psychologist, but there's something about the spaces where um, we sort of live our everyday lives and how we um, build community and maintain community that can be therapeutic and protective and holding. And so what we want to do, I think, in sort of thinking about these, sort of very wide range impacts across, you know, people like my myself, who I am not Windrush, but I'm descended from Windrush. And I mm -hmm. personally felt heartbroken, feel heartbroken by the whole thing. Um, and my dad passed away last year. And I think a lot about how he felt when I said I was moving to England, <laughs> um, perhaps because of his own knowledge of his mother's experiences when she moved to England and, and, and sort of what that sort of means on a grander scale for the fact that through, across generations, people, we know that we, we are struggling. We know that these struggles don't end from one generation to another. And so it becomes really important to create a space, I think, to recognize and to hear that and to hold that as truth and to, to sort of, I guess, create an acceptance of that. Um, and I think that increasingly psychological practice sort of moving in that direction to really acknowledge the intergenerational consequences of these factors and the, the wider, communi wider community traumas. And I think solutions do start with creating opportunities to connect with others who share an experience with you to sort of feel that you are not on your own. Um, yeah. And I think um, some, no, that's, that's really helpful. And, and uh, the next question is somebody, as it were, pushing that question about what the toolkit looks like for dealing with those kinds of issues that you're talking about. So the question is being born and raised in Britain from a Jamaican background, where do I fit in? I'm an Englishman in Jamaica and a black man in the UK. Yeah, it really, I mean, that question, I struggle, I mean, all I can say is, I hear that, and I don't know if we know the answer yet. Um, I hear that and feel that as a Canadian woman in the UK, who was born to Jamaican parents, and feel there was that phrase about being like sort of a citizen of nowhere that sometimes happens um, uh, as we sort of split these differences. Um, and I think for me, um, it becomes really important to this idea of building a community. So I would sort of feel that, you know, whoever has asked this question is sort of in solidarity with me. Like we sort of know each other's realities a little bit, not entirely, because my experience as a black woman is different. Um, my experience than, than somebody who is uh, a black man in society. Um, and I guess what I'd really like to see are opportunities for 
for people's personhood, no matter where it's situated or positioned to be respected. It's because those terms come with connotations to them, isn't it? So what it means to be a black man is painful in the UK and what it means to be a foreigner in Jamaica sometimes can be painful. And that's the thing that requires these sort of wider movements, these, um, these opportunities and, and the opportunity to make these other connections on different dimensions of personhood. Because I think many people would say that there's a dimension of themselves that is othered, that they experience an othering from. Um, and to sort of survive through that, we really need to connect with others either who experience that othering in a same way or a similar way, and to trust that the systems and societies around us are in motion. And even though when you're in it, it feels like we aren't, one of the things that um, my, um, my husband always reminds me of is the fact that many years ago, and not that many years ago, it would have been illegal for he and I to be married because he is white British. Um, and so we must sometimes look at change in the long scale to be reminded that things aren't always fixed and that they can change and that they, they will change to sort of help keep us going in those fights to drive additional change. Um, the compensation scheme. Um, there's a question here, a specific question about um, how people can uh, help push the compensation scheme. And, and, and it'd be good to have you sort of reflect a little bit on the compensation scheme more generally, isn't it? Because in a sense, what, what one wants is justice payments. You want, you want the government to be kind of fined. You don't just want to have to have people to be proved that, you know, they lost two hours of work that was worth um, you know, 50 pounds for X or Y or Z. Um, uh, what do we do about the compensation scheme and how can we get it moving? Yeah, so, I mean, there have been various petitions actually um, in recent years, uh, which have actually called for the removal of the compensation scheme from the home office to an independent body. Because the um, Wendy Williams independent report um, the first one that she did um, sort of in 2020 and then the update this year really highlights that the Home Office has struggled to make the type of systemic changes that are needed to really make them an organization that can engage with people in the type of way that's needed, that can engage with survivors in the type of way that's needed. And so what the whole thing becomes um, is an incredibly bureaucratic exercise, this tick boxing thing that they're just looking for the right pieces of evidence. And there is no, um, which actually was part of the problem in the first end of how basically um, Windrush victims ended up embroiled in this scandal was because of tick box exercises and not really sort of system that, that allowed people to sort of think and move outside of them. And I think Amelia, gentleman's book on, on the Windrush betrayal is a really good book to read if you're interested in thinking a bit about more, more of those themes and schemes. Um, but there are different organizations that are trying to support people in their claims uh, for, against the, for this scheme um, that you could reach out to to help support them. So for example, Windrush Lives and the um, who we are working with. Um, I know they're these organizations are just sort of working constantly to try and sort of support people in this process and they're understaffed and under-resourced. Um, there's a new collective of actors um, uh, who's like a Windrush um, Justice or Compensation Project um, at the University of Westminster um, where they've sort of where they're sort of working to support people um, in their claims processes but ultimately it seems that unless you have that outside support, it is a weathering experience. It's almost an impossible experience to negotiate. And one of the things that um, Patrick um, has called for in the past, Patrick Vernon, is automatic payments. Rather than putting the burden of proof on people who are already so hurt and broken by a system, why would you then send them to do more paperwork? It just bog it boggles the mind. So 
if you create an automatic compensation scheme of a, up to a certain level, that's just an automatic thing. And then um, sort of scaling up from there, um, in a way it might sort of help um, people to um, sort of feel as if something has been achieved, but it really sort of feels that when you read the accounts of survivors who are trying to go, get through the scheme um, and struggling to get through the scheme is that, and I think that people in the home office would disagree with this, this comment, but from what I've heard from survivors is that they're really not trying to compensate people. It doesn't feel that way. It doesn't look that way when you hear people's stories. And, you know, they will always counter that millions have been paid out and this and that. But I think when you go to the ground to individual stories, those two things don't seem to add up. So the main thing I suppose I would really like to see, particularly if we're going to be thinking about how we embed mental health into that narrative, into that mm. space, is that it might need to come out of the home office. I just don't yeah. see how you do that. It does, um, an automatic compensation scheme does seem more like a sort of justice payment, doesn't it? It, yeah. seems, um, it, it seems fairer. Um, one minute, if we can, yeah. what do we do to ensure that it doesn't happen again? <laughs> One minute for the hardest question. Um, I think I think it really comes down to the fact that we have very incomplete understandings of our histories. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is a, a real necessity to tell the complicated histories of our nations, of our countries, of our mm -hmm. world, and to tell them to people from the beginning like to ha and to have those uncomfortable con conversations because i think there's really a real lack of awareness about even sort of a policy history in mm. in sort of mm -hmm. in this country let alone sort of like the wider social history of black communities and what they've done in the country mm -hmm. so i think in order to ensure it doesn't happen again i think we need to really have that knowledge at our fingertips um, and we also really need to sort of remember, um, remember that when we're making decisions about who we choose to put in power of our countries and political systems. So I, I think that's absolutely right. And I, I can tell you what I'd like the future to look like. Um, mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> again, I do. <laughs> I do this with some uh, with, with some caution, but I uh, again have an anecdote from my um, my family. Mm. One of my one of my children who has three passports used to continually be asked by people um, in different places, "Where's home for you?" Mm. And of course, the question "Where's home for you?" is really a question: um, "Are you one of us?" Um, and he got sick of answering it, so in the end, he used to say, "Wherever I am not." And what I kind of hope is that one day we'll all be able to say wherever I am. And yeah. um, that's a bit of a nirvana, but yeah. we've got to commit to working to being and creating that kind of community. And when there are just egregious racist injustices like this, empowering communities to take action in response. So um, thank you uh, uh, incredibly for your lecture. Um, it's been a great privilege to have you. And um, uh, I'm, I'm sure that there'll be many questions in your inbox yeah. um, <laughs> about methodology and how people can participate in one way or another. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Provost. And thanks, everyone, for watching. <laughs>